have peripheral artery disease. Um, Dr. Nonso and Dr. Seko are here, ready for you. If you start shortly, call your friends to come in. We'll be showing up shortly. All right, good um, afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Iseko, and this is uh, Dr. Nomso Aganya. Dr. Aganya. <laughs> is Aganya or Aganya? Aganya. Jeez, I don't know how you say it too much. <laughs> Welcome. Dr. Nomso is a commercial education and technologist. Uh, Iseko, uh, for those who have been on this channel, you should know me. Um, I'm a physician and cardiologist, uh, mainly interventional cardiology. I'm just coming from the theater, as you can see. So we are we are live here from Cardio Care Hospital here in Abuja. We are happy to have you. Um, today we'll be talking about peripheral vascular disease. Very, very important topic. Very, very important uh, uh, in cardiovascular medicine and practice. And then um, for all of us watching, we want to make sure that our practice is improved. We know that we are, a lot of people have many complaints in our, in our economy, in our country. But we believe that, that when we teach, when we work, we can contribute our own to giving our patients the very best. So I do have anything to say? No much. Not much. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the session. I hope you learned something. Yes, um, we know that a lot of people are losing their limbs in diabetes, and uh, one of the problems we have is people being able to recognize the disease early. Doctor, I haven't thought of the experience been like. Yeah, it's actually very, very serious in terms of diabetes management. As a matter of fact, I belong to Society of Podiatry in Nigeria. Podiatry, yes. Oh, I know there's a society. Yes, I have a society. As a, as a local knowledge, they don't they have interest in it. Okay. Because I actually lost a colleague of ours, diabetic foot, it was serious a turning point for me, particularly, and I have interest in that peripheral to disease. But most times, patients have this, uh, this problem of societal influence in the sense that they have so many beliefs from traditional practices, churches, whereby they have. The diabetic patient has a wound, this will be to go to the doctor, they might choose to go to the pastor and start applying things, for, um, olive oil and all of things. Wow. Now, traditionalists, they go to see traditionalists where they make marks and put a lot of things on the leg, telling them that they probably marked something. <laughs> so it's a serious issue. And we keep on educating because the way this elevation is to him, that injury on the foot is to me because you lose patients on a daily basis. From toothpick injury, nail, some people, some people are missing to carry nail on their legs. You understand? So, really, it's a big issue, and we keep on educating and pressing on patients at the same time that they should do proper foot care. And 
come to hospital for monitoring. Most especially the acrobatic index to make it a routine in our uh, clinical, yeah, clinical practice for that because you can catch people at very early stages. Okay, so thank you all. We have over 75 people that have joined this webinar for February from Cardio Care Hospital in Abuja. Cardio Care is a center of excellence for cardiovascular medicine that includes peripheral artery disease, um, cardio, cardiac disease, endocrinology, neurology, cardiology. So in Northern Nigeria, um, Cardio Care has remained a center of excellence in offering care across the spectrum of cardiovascular health. So as part of our commitment to doing great things in the country, here's what we are, we are sharing, peripheral arterial disease. We believe that as you, as you listen, that your care for your patients will improve. There are some things you will have looked overlooked that may, that you know today. So the objective for today is to refresh our overall knowledge on peripheral arterial disease, to improve our ability to screen, and to fight people. One of the things that pains us most in cardio care is when patients come in already with gangrene. We like to have the patients that have the peripheral artery disease come in early, so that when we give our intervention, put in a stent, open up the blockages, that there's a fantastic result. So one of the things that we love is when patients come in on time. And the key to patients coming on time is the physician, the first palliative physician's ability to recognize um, the, the problem. So then our ability to evaluate uh, with symptomatic or asymptomatic peripheral arterial disease and want to improve our capacity for management. So, um, and then to know when to refer. So, Dr. Agaya, can you tell us about the definition of peripheral arterial disease? Okay. By simple definition, peripheral arterial disease is a condition in which there is stenosis or occlusion in the aorta or the arteries of the limbs. Okay. Then, atherosclerosis is in, is meaning. So, in, in, anytime there is narrowing yeah, okay. or total blockage of the blood vessels supplying arteries of the limbs, so typically, or non cardiac arteries, really, because peripheral is actually wider than just um, yeah. the lower limbs. But I know there's a new entity that they are calling it lower extremity arterial disease, which is a subcomponent of peripheral arteries. But for today's um, work, we'll be talking more on as concerns the lower limb. So in this case, any time there's narrowing or complete blockage of you know blood supply to the lower limbs, we'll term that as um, peripheral arterial yes. disease. Yes. And uh, you were talking about atherosclerosis. Yes, we have um, the cause. Okay. But also thrombosis, embolism, vasculitis can be a cause, depending on when the thrombosis is formed and the embolus that can be cause, also cause occlusion. Total or partial occlusion of the vessel and reducing loss of light to the target mm -hmm. organs. Now, tissue, sorry. Vasculitis is also a cause of peripheral disease. It can lead to vessel occlusion and so perfusion. In vasculitis, essentially, vasculitis just means that it's inflation of the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Typically, autoimmune disease, typically HIV, you know, and other things. But then you begin to see that you should also be sure that you'll see. Other attendant features, arthritis, um, skin rash, um, or in our case in Nigeria, um, peripheral. So, we now further go further and we talk about critical limb ischemia. But for critical limb ischemia, so the first one we say, anytime there's just narrowing. When it becomes critical is when there's gangrene, when there's an ulcer, like you talked about, since the friend, uh, our colleague that we lost, talk when there's tissue loss. Or when there is pain at rest. So a lot of times I talk about pain when people are moving, but occasionally pain at rest. When it lasts more than two weeks um, with an ankle, absolute ankle pressure of less than 50, we talk about peripheral, I mean, critical limb ischemia. Okay? And by the time people, people are having critical limb ischemia, the disease has gone far. Very, very far. The thing has gone far. And the, the need to act is there, is critical. One of the uh, specialties that we specialize in is being able to offer that care. Okay, so anytime we have this advanced occlusion of the arteries, the extremities are at risk. So we call that a limb threatening um, um, disease. So at certain point in time, it is just that there is a flow limitation and we still call that peripheral arterial disease. 
But at a particular time, it becomes immune threatening, or it has already started causing loss of tissue. Then we talk about that uh, critical illness. So uh, manifest clinically more with rest pain and ulcers. How often do we see rest pain? Uh, have you, what, what is your experience like, Dr. Adain? Um, as a matter of fact, you know, what most doctors always ask patients about is pain on walking, that is diameter blood pressure. Yeah. And another thing is most of the time when the patient says he has pain on the leg, they have too much telepathy and they don't bother going further than that. Yeah. Until you now start seeing that clearing of foot and I start thinking to us. So the idea of this presentation is also make us understand that not only diabetic neuropathy yeah. that cause pain on the feet in the patient, especially when it's persistent and yeah. addressed. Yes, intermediate medication, the failure pump, when it's act and, 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 and function will give you pain. But now, when the patient stops working, the pain goes away. But when the pain becomes persistent, it means that the occlusion is terminal. And the patient, most times, will think that pain is at rest. But there's a problem of confusing you know, it's the one of the slides. Yeah. The party pain and vascular pain. pain. OK, so this is a case. It's like Jibril, 68-year-old man, diabetes hypertensive, numbness in the feet in the last one year. And like you said, a lot of times we we'll just say, ah, you are diabetic. Ah, uh, paja uh, that's what Yoruba would call it. I want to call it. <laughs> yeah, Yoruba said, Paja Paja, that is like abnormal sensation, pins and needles. So that is it happened to diabetes. But no, for we that have attended this webinar, we should know that there are other things. So the pain is worse at night. He has only minimal relief with gabapentin, which was prescribed by his doctor. Glycemic control is good. Last HB1C was 6.7%. One week ago, he noted darkening of his first and second toe on the left. There was also a small wound at the tip of the first toe and a blister on the second toe. How should he be evaluated? Yes, I will type in the chat box. Uh, we have over close to 100 plus people that have joined us today. We are, called, we are making it from cardio care, with specialty in hospital. We are talking about peripheral artery disease. Um, can we type in the chat box what you will do next? You have this man, he has a, a wound on his foot, he has diabetes hypertension, HbA1c is 6.7%. How will you evaluate him? So can we just type, type in the chat box so that we can see? Yes, 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 yes. We want to see your responses. We have over 100 people. Don't worry. Um, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, type in the chat box. If, if, it's, if you have any question throughout this talk, please remember to just put it in the Q&A box. I will answer at the end. Um, and then if you want to talk, just raise your hands. And then when we have the opportunity, we will see how we can share. So don't, not to waste any, I mean, much time. Um, we'll go ahead to the presentation. So this is like a typical patient that comes in with this kind of thing. So um, what about the epidemiology, sir? What, what has it been like? Yeah. The prevalence actually increases with age. Of course, of course. And greater than 10 percent. Five, so efficient today. Since the 70, greater than 10 percent. The global aging population, so the thoughts rising to balance. Yeah. It's common in men. I don't know why men always. <laughs> also, more likely to be severe and symptomatic in men. Yeah. Vascular is, pain. It, is it because men, 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 men don't go to the hospital in time or what? Yeah, I'm walking around and I'm still off. <laughs> So muscle complications are commoner in females. So actually a strong marker of cardiovascular disease associated with concomitant coronary and cerebrovascular disease plus antecedent increase in mortality. This is very true, even, even if patients is asymptomatic. So anybody that has peripheral artery disease is called a, a coronary artery disease equivalent. I mean equivalent. Yeah. If you has leg pain, um asymptomatic leg pain or I mean, asymptomatic, even though it is asymptomatic you don't have any symptoms but you're able to detect that they have peripheral artery disease assume that they have coronary artery disease and also know that in those patients risk of death is higher coronary uh, artery disease risk of stroke is higher because the same mechanism atrial mechanism that is now affecting the vessels will affect the smaller vessels in the brain 
and all of that. So um, this is quite important. Now, the time you have vascular complications, typically in women, it seems to, it tends to be more, uh, while the overall thing tends to be commoner uh, mm -hmm. in women. But in Nigeria, um, there are some studies that have been published uh, in different areas. We have um, Charles Odenigo et al., Mwere et al., I think Mwere et al. is in uh, Delta. Uh, that's a cardiologist. Um, Abu Boroma et al., all published different studies, but generally shows that about 20 to 30% of patients with hypertension, that is one in three, already have some peripheral disease. But the problem is that we're not checking it. And then those with diabetes, up to one in two. Okay, and make, most of the studies use ankle brachial index. We will talk about ankle brachial index in a bit and how to do it. So, a majority of the patients are asymptomatic. Okay, so you're talking about um, uh, physiology and how it happens uh, generally. So, you were saying that mainly atherosclerosis, right? Yes, it's the it's commonest mechanism of action. And then it now goes to narrowing, then there's decreased perfusion, then blood flow, both at rest and exertional is not, not enough. So, what I mean, why does it happen on exertion and at rest? Can you walk us through something about the um, this part of physiology? Okay, first of all, an atherosclerosis, as you know, that's not the the that's the diagram. Okay, uh, from the diagram, as you can see, at the initiation of atherosclerosis, what actually happens there is there is association of lipoproteins in communication with the vascular intima. Yeah. And now this can be as a result of maybe um, leakages or interaction of lipoprotein with the extracellular matrix. Yeah. Now that's being done after the lipoprotein accumulation. Next thing that happens there is it undergoes oxidation. Lipoprotein undergoes oxidation to produce different enzymes. So the lipoprotein gets um, exposed to the matrix of the extracellular uh, wall of the intima. Yes. And then that now undergoes oxidation. Okay. Now that you can produce different enzymes. I go, um, a lot of enzymes. Yeah. Have a lot of enzymes. So, but, but after that, the next thing that happens is there is recruitment of leukocytes okay. to this area. Okay. So without recruitment of leukocytes, most especially, Macrophages and yeah. lymphocytes. Yeah. They invade the area. After invasion of this area, these leukocytes and macrophages will undergo ingestion of, of lipids. What you call the form what you call foam cells. Yeah. Yes. So with this function of these foam cells, this is an ateroma, as in at the point of this formation of this atherosclerosis. Yeah. Right. So with these foam cells that are formed in that place. There is what we call new vessel formation. Now, new, this new vessel formation, as you can see from this, from the um, diagram, has some implication. It can distort the plague that's already formed. Yeah. It can also recruit more white blood cells to the area of the ateroma to further worsen. Yes. And literally, new vessels are friable, so they can also bleed, cause leakage, attracting more lipid to the area and more. Um, call it? A more white cell, white cell blood, and white, and white blood cells to the area now. So now, with this, the the the, the area also contains calcium. Then, after all this accumulation, now the process of cellular migration, new vessel formation, and um, all this white blood cell. Um, Movement migration of this area by site by all these endothelial um, stimulation factors now lead to formation of this um, thrombin that now form the actual atherosclerosis, uh, actual atherosclerosis that increases in size and starts obstructing the, 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 flow. the flow of blood. So, in summary, what we're saying is that first of all, you have a, a, a plaque, yes. you have the extracellular matrix gets chipped off. Yes. Then there's exposure of the matrix to the flowing flow of blood. Yes. That now exposes, releases some chemicals, increases new blood vessels on the formation, white blood cells. recruits white blood cells, foam cells are formed, calcium is, also calcium is deposited. Yes. 
it begins to grow and grow and grow. So that growing now will stop the lumen the, exactly. of, 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 exactly. the lumen of the vessel. Then the lumen of the vessel it begins to increase until the lumen is narrow. Totally obstructed. So in the initial points, as we go on, as it becomes narrowed, the pain you are seeing now, when the person now walks some distance, yeah. the increased need for blood supply in the leg now is what now causes the um, initial intermittent yeah. provocation. However, by the time most patients, a lot of patients are presenting, they already have rest pain. So the pain is just there at rest. Now, a lot of healthcare workers typically miss it because the person will say, the pain is always there. They'll say, since it's always there, it is not. But that is a mistake. By that time, it has progressed to even total occlusion. So it has started from intermediate connection. If you take your time, take your history. We, we did a case for a man uh, three weeks ago. He had a very high blockage in his iliac vessels. Yeah. By the time we went in, without asking, no, tell us the truth. He said, actually, for over five years, it has been coming and going. And then after a while, he said, he just stayed there. Different people have given him different drugs. They told him it is in his back, it is his buttocks. No, it is his leg. It is the way he's sleeping. So before we now realized there was total occlusion of blood supply to the entire left leg. And then we opened it up by the base of God. So these are the things that come into play. Then endothelial cell dysfunction, it now worsens and it keeps on growing. So this is like a, a, an ateroma yes. that forms and then until it becomes a total occlusion. Of course, there are risk factors. Smoking increases the risk times four. We've had patients come in with their only risk factor was just smoking. So in patients that have peripheral disease and are smokers, the best thing you can do for them first is to stop smoking. In fact, if you do only stop smoking in some patients, you may not need to intervene surgically or otherwise. It is such a strong um, you know, risk factor in the progression and establishment of the disease. Okay, Of course, diabetes. <laughs> diabetes is the one that hypertension, cholesterol, and other forms of inflammation are also uh, at play. So can imagine a diabetic person that is smoking <laughs> six times. He, he has tried. Okay, so the other risk factors, hypothyroidism, people that use oral contraceptives, um, chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis, all of them. So what about the patient? How do the patient present, sir? Actually, can be asymptomatic, like we said earlier. Yeah. But it doesn't stop. One in two are asymptomatic. But still, you must, inter you must still know whether to intervene. And check at least for the microbiome. Is it possible for critical ischemia? To be asymptomatic, it can be. First of all, I, I want to start with people's pain threshold. First of all, okay, yes. okay. Like as a moral father, I'm not using the box. These fulanis, they have a very, very, very high pain threshold. I'm telling you, it's not one of them. They have low. No, they have high. Okay. They have higher pain. Okay, but okay right. yes. So now, as in, it's so bad that on the market court or someone buying this. Um, like this thing in the air, I wouldn't even know the matter court until what told me now open and I said, Well, the court almost so that can be can play a part in terms of the pain that you have. But most times, I feel they might come with pain, yeah. Most, most, uh, most times, I feel but it's almost because when there's an obstruction and there's the piece blood supply to the valuable tissue, obviously. There will be hypoxia and then, so. and then some numbness. Numbness uh, uh, coming in. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then some people come with asymptomatic symptoms. Some people come with almost one in three uh, symptoms that are neither here nor there. It does not follow any classical pattern, just paracysias, uh, you know. Then, of course, you can see how low intermittent communication is. Yes. So, a lot of us are waiting for that medical school. And when you when I walk and I have pain, and when I get when I relax a bit, then the pain stops. Yes, fantastic, very good. But see that is only one in six people that we have that. The remaining five of our six people will not have that classical one. One in two will have nothing. Then those without critical limb ischemia, unfortunately, these are the people, these are the time when people come. And most times it progresses almost, you know, it's, you know, and then we now have acute limb ischemia. Now, the difference between acute limb ischemia and the rest of this is, actually, is that acute limb ischemia typically comes in acutely. High pain and all the five Ps. You remember the five Ps again? Pain, pallor, 
paresthesias, you know, pulselessness. So there will be no pulse in that entire leg. The place will be cold. So you have cold limb. It is pale. There's paresthesias. It is dusky. Typically, the pain is not here. Okay, so we've had so, those, those kind of people need to get to the cath lab as soon as possible. Otherwise, they lose that limb. So typically, within ten, within five hours, they are coming. But that's only one percent of patients. Okay, so we're talking about this claudication. Uh, so we're talking about claudication and rest pain. And uh, you was, we were saying that it's uncommon. That classical, when I walk, I have pain. When I rest, I don't have pain. Is uncommon. Now there's also intermittent neurogenic claudication, intermittent neurogenic, which is different from our own claudication for vascular. In intermittent neurogenic claudication, what happens is that um, you have problems with the spinal column and the nerve supplying the limbs. So typically, spinal stenosis or other uh, compressive myelopathies. In that case, when the person walks, they get numbness and paresthesia, no pain. And then when they rest, they get relief. So that is intermittent neurogenic. They will have some shock like They will have some shock like things, yes. But in this case of lower limb arterial disease, what they have now is pain, cramps, aches, typically during exercise and relief by rest. But it is that alone is rare. The reason why we are talking about this so significantly is that one in two people in your clinic with diabetes and hypertension have one in three have this um arterial disease. If you don't check, you will not find them. If you don't find them, you will not give them the best treatment that is possible for them. So once again, uh, Dr. Monso is with me. My name is Dr. Seko from Cardio Care Hospital here in Abuja. And then uh, we are talking about uh, peripheral arterial disease with a focus on lower extremity arterial disease. Our hope is to save limbs. Our hope is to stop amputation. Our hope is to reduce death that occurs from around people that have peripheral vascular disease. And we hope that you, those over 135 people joining us on this call today um, will take this message to their clinics, to their healthcare organizations, and make sure that people do not die from this. This is peaked. This is, um, the, now we're not talking about critical limb ischemia. We said coldness of the feet, rest pain, you know, even at night when the leg, when they raise the leg, they are still having, they are still having pain. Can you talk about this Lerich uh, syndrome? We used to like it in the part two. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, a more, it's just like that uh, intermittent claudication. Okay. Yes, but at this particular point, it's an extreme form of it involving different vessels, by at the iliac vessel, iliac. And the specific thing is the triad of patient three and bump claudication. Yes. That it has impotence and then absence of several pulses. Pulses. Now, this impotence obviously is supposed to be it's a, it's a neuronal problem, but due to vaso navorum, yeah, that, that's when it, it's not supplied to the yes. nerves now. But then, the, as the patient is lost, yeah, that's when I have the impotence. Okay, fine. So, uh, I can see so our. <laughs> oh, they say chat box disabled. So, people are saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Pamela, something is happening that the chat box is disabled. Okay, let me enable the chat box. Good. All right. All right, so chat box is now enabled so that we can we can put some of our chats in the chat box. And then we have the Q&A uh, for asking questions. Um, so chat, chat box is now enabled. So we're talking about Mr. Jibril. He said he came with rest pain. He had a, an ulcer. He was fine. Diabetes, but he, diabetes was well controlled. This is quite important. Sometimes we get to clinic. What's your fasting blood sugar? Um, 84. What's your HbA1c? 6.5. And we say go. That is not correct. Everybody with hypertension diabetes must be checked. Their feet will be checked for redness, coldness. They must be asked about rest pain. They must be asked about cramps. The dorsalis pedis must be checked. They must do cardiac legs. It is some level of, um, what was the word? I don't want to say competence or quackery or something. What's the word? What's the good word that we can use in this place? Anyway, it's a level of some standard care for you to see a diabetic hypertensive 
they have been following up with you and you are not checking it because some people even develop limb arterial disease before the onset of clinical diabetes. Yes. So if you are looking at this HbA1c being controlled and say no, it cannot be. No. If the person has diabetes, what do they say? Higher risk. So you need to now check. So this Lerich syndrome, patient come with impotence. It automatically says that all your patient impotence must check for femoral pulse. Essentially, it is autoiliac disease. That is to say, the peripheral artery disease is happening at a higher level. It's happening at the point where the aorta gives rise to the iliac. And we did one case uh, two weeks ago. Very fantastic case. We opened it up in the cat lab without, without surgery. Okay? And then once you open it up, no blood supply. I saw the man today. That's what I'm talking about. So there is now affecting all the blood supply. So it's giving rise, those ones in the pelvis are also affected. So femoral is gone, clonication is there, and the patient is having impotence. And so you need to consider very significantly that you need to look at this. Now, this is the spectrum of uh, peripheral artery disease. Um, so for those that are just joining us, we're joining from cardio care, you will get the slides at the end of the presentation uh, using the email that you used to register. And then you can watch again on our YouTube channel where we have several other topics. Take your time, improve yourself, and then contact us. You can also refer patients to us here in Abuja. Um, we are within uh, reach for all patients that need this kind of care. So look at the whole stretch. A lot of times you have worsening flow mutation going towards the blue area. A lot of times, unfortunately, sir, our patients are coming from rest pain. In fact, <laughs> gangrene. Gangrene. What, what has been your experience? By the time a patient is coming to a, to a specialist or even to a doctor sometimes, they are coming with gangrene. You know, the, the issue here, like they always say, refer to is I feel the tip, a lot of patients start with you as a doctor at yeah. the first instance. And knowing when to refer matters so much. And at the same time, if you are confused, please always refer. Don't just go and start trying. Because most times, what you get in the tail end is someone that has a gangrenous yeah. from it, and all, all kinds of infective ulcers yeah. coming in. Now you are dealing with three things here. Refractory disease, infected ulcer, and then most likely neuropathy. Yeah. Now, how, how would the infection go with refractory disease? Not <laughs> You know, it becomes a problem. So yeah. when, you, when you arrest it at the level of just peripheral artery disease to avoid patient having an ulcer or injury there, it becomes easier. Yeah. So that's just my own. Most times they come, and now you know we left with trying to do all maneuvers to know if you can stop loss of life in that area, and at the same time treating the infection and I'm very glad. And green that's already there, yes. orthopedics. You will most times you still have to use some tissue, you know. Uh, so it's important for us to know that first of all, from asymptomatic, some of them will now start with pain and ache, tiredness in their feet, tightness, weakness, numbness. This typically precedes the clinication. So by the time you start seeing this, you begin to check for the uh, check the pulses, begin to do your Doppler studies, begin to consider uh, care. Now they now move on to clonification, mild, moderate, severe. And then before they now move on to limb threatening ischemia, which is now critical ischemia. They have poor wound healing, they have rest pain, they have either overt gangrene. Or, and when you look at some of the people that are fair, you will see the darkness of the feet yeah. in relation to the other leg. Darkened, the person is complaining of pain. It is all it is so wrong for somebody to be complaining of pain and you do not examine the feet. You must look at it, especially in these patients that have high risk. Before they begin to complain about clinication, these are things that you must do. Now, how do you now differentiate neuropathic from ischemic? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Exactly. Now, sometimes every time everybody will just say everything. Uh, so they say neuropathic is relieved by walking. While in ischemic is, is worsened by walking. And uh, neuropathic, they typically will complain of numbness, pins, and needles. But I must say that more often than not, it, it coexists. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. You cannot, from clinical examination alone, say it is neuropathic. 
you can only suggest that is neuropathic. You must examine other things. You must do angle beta pressure index before you summarize because neuropathic can coexist with ischemic. And like we said earlier, vasa nevorum. Sometimes it's a ischemic one that is possibly because of neuropathy that you're looking at. Then we talked about uh, distal souls, you know, uh, wild ischemic more, you know, in the calf. And, but these things, is it 100%? Actually, why, why the neuropathy is more in souls because of the pressure points? But the ischemic, due to the loss, that's why, due to the loss of light earlier, yeah. yeah. that makes it more, the loss are more. Okay. All right. So um, um, I'm very happy with the answers to how we manage this algebra. Uh, so uh, sometimes you can use this. We had a patient that says where he has been feeling like his heart beat in his, his buttocks. When we did his peripheral angio, we saw an aneurysm there, just pulsating, pulsating, pulsating. Unfortunately, it came very late. With diabetes. So most times the higher the disease, it determines where you will feel it. People that are having pain in their buttocks and hip to their thigh, typically are talking of a disease from iota coming down. Why people that are feeling the pain in the calves to the leg, they are talking of superficial femoral popliteal. And when people are having collocation in the foot, when they walk, they have it on the foot, they're talking about more distal vessels. So the level of the pain corresponds with the level of the artery and how the artery um, you know, follows through. Okay. So what are the, I mean, you're talking about the, I mean, most patients now, which, where are most patients affected, Dr. Tamara? Is, is, there, is there any reason why? Do you think that there's any uh, Yes, I feel because, you know, if you remember from our background with the physiology, the solar pump, as, as a matter of fact, is uh, you can call this table or this front of that kind of physiology. Yeah, that, that's a lot of aspiration and it can even increase cardiac output. I remember, yes, in the calf, in the city, up and coming down. And uh, so that solar pump is a major factor. So, only imagine when there's an obstruction in any of those vessels and you have to match it. And that much it causes blood to flow. That's what I I thought about it before today. <laughs> why is it more? So I have to ask myself, why well, uh, the that solar pump is actually a very good as in high physiology reason for blood flow? Of course, there's nobody there's no there's no consensus on why. Not, yeah, everybody, not, not everybody just has a different postulate on why it's so, okay. well of course most people in the femoral and popular, most yeah. people. They follow by tibial and femoral, they, they, before you now come to, and this corresponds with our clinical practice, really. All the cases we've done peripheral and, geogra and geography for and geoplasty, typically it's in this order. And then some people have extensive disease across the entire. That's the question. Is it that you don't have more as a, accessing it as compared to computer and those other ones? Don't you feel like more than thirty percent? It's possible. It's been very possible. But you know that to here, um, like I had a friend's father. Most times they have to do the amputation very high, not just above me, but also very high above me. And the thing about auto ilia is that the patient will be feeling the pain, but it's in the entire leg, and because it's the entire leg, most people typically. So it's possible that it may be higher, but because more often than not, auto ilia patients are diagnosed. By CT because it's inside the abdomen. Of course, it's possible. And femoral popliteal, you are seeing it more. You have the pain in the leg, tibial, femoral, you know, all those areas. So it's, it's quite. You are, you are very right. You're very right. All right. So, um, clinical risk factors. Um, these five P's of pulselessness, paralysis, pain, pallor. That is typically in the acute limb ischemia. So you are not waiting for it in a patient that comes like that. Say wait. There's no pallor. Wait, there's this one. No, 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 no. In fact, there could still be pause while the patient is having it. So you need to inspect. You need to look at the skin. You need to look thin, smooth, shiny skin, you know, darkening of the feet, skin discoloration, cold to touch. Um, skin typically are signs that you look out for. And then you look at late changes, also gangrene, you know. Um, my time patient has gangrene, it's a sign of failure of the healthcare system. 
and failure of all the people that have been seen. So anytime I see a patient with gangrene, if I ask my first question is where have you been having your care? Who has been checking you? Well, how did we miss it as a healthcare community? How did we miss it when you were coming for clinic? And when the person that tells you that I've been coming for clinic regularly for the past five years, nobody has ever checked my foot sample. Hey, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an indictment on the healthcare system. So these are the things we are checking. We need to look first. We need to look. You see the skin thinned out. It is shiny. It is smooth. It is dark. You know, uh, there is some, uh, you know, are there other things uh, that you see, sir? Just, these are mainly the yeah, main, these are the main things. Yes. You know, just if someone is patient to you. People are being patient to you. I think you can also have patient load at times. <laughs> yes. Actually affects. Yes. Yeah. And, and our doctors are Japan more and more. I believe <laughs> it's, it's too much. So, <laughs> if doctor to patient ratio is reducing, I mean, it's becoming more and more terrible. So, you are in a hurry. But no matter how much you are in a hurry, put yes. your, just open, look at the foot, look at the shin, of the this thing, look at the headlessness and put your fingers, this your two fingers and your stethoscope on the dorsalis pedis. And if what time they are beginning to have symptoms, at least once a year, plan them for a foot exam, a thorough foot exam, where you do monofilament tests, you do your ankle brachial pressure index. And those that have failed it, you will now put them in a more regular exam. We have staging of disease, and I don't think we should cram it. All you should just know is that from asymptomatic claudication to rest pain to ulceration and to gangrene. <laughs> By the time a patient is presenting with ulcer, you know that the patient has come in very late. But we as doctors now that have been in this webinar should know that we should pick a lot of our patients when they're asymptomatic. In fact, when they're already at risk, and we've talked about the people that are at risk, people with hypothyroidism, diabetes, hypertension, smokers, people with just hypercholesterolemia, we should watch out for this, um, this in this regard. So, for Mr. Jibril, the initial tests, initial things that we always do. These are the things, Abi. Yes. Basic tests. Uh, I don't have HbA1c. Please do HbA1c. Find where you can do HbA1c. Is that true? No, I'm talking about okay. uh, somebody because okay, sometimes okay, we yeah. have a very wide reach. We have okay. our 149 is called. And uh, some people will say, "Well, I don't have HbA1c. Please, Nigeria okay. has gone far. You can take that sample and get HbA1c because when you are managing diabetes, it's a tripod uh, in chronic diabetes, Abi. Yeah. Your, your fasting uh, glycemia, your postpandial glycemia, and your HbA1c, you need the three of them to properly manage the sugar. Now, remember, you are not just managing sugar. This is where a lot of doctors make the mistake. And start managing sugar, your sugar is fine. You are managing the patient, not the sugar. So as you're managing the patient, you need to manage the cholesterol, the blood pressure, and the vasculature, and complications, uh, erectile dysfunction, eyesight, you need to manage all of that. There is no point having normal blood sugar and the patient still develops that because you did not check. Okay, so you need to do your analysis. We call it a cardiovascular risk workup. Typically, every patient that comes with diabetes, you must do all of this. You must do all of this. First time diagnosis, at least once or twice a year, make sure when you come for clinic, you just check it so that we can pick up the patient. But it doesn't mean that sometimes we, we even we sometimes still miss some of these cases. So yeah, someone can you talk us to someone in lookalikes? Okay, that may happen. You know, particularly when we talked about it, mostly dependent areas. The patient and the pain cannot be can actually differentiate the pain. Yes, one is in the morning, the other one is the same. But another thing, you know, particularly as helplessness and then because of sweating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sweat has like so that you can have find infections. So for spondylosis and radiculopathy, like you said earlier, I can be a compressive radiculopathy, depending on where and age of the person, whether this is coming out. When eventually the nerve roots are occluded in any form, they can give you also pain during the lower limb, depending on what is precisely lumbar spondylosis. Yeah, but you know that spondylosis and radiculopathy and autoiliac disease will present almost exactly the same. Yes. Because they will have pain in the lower abdomen, and then the pain is going down. Uh, autoiliac disease too will have pain also going down. Back pain. Back pain, yeah. radiating downwards. The other one too, back pain. And most of the other the patients will have some prognosis. So you will say, okay, let, maybe that's all. So we need to be careful about that. And it could really be very, it could be, uh, the man told me that he has prognosis. I, I said, no, 
Yeah. So by that way now, mm-hmm. even know this is happening, but see, one thing we have some like this is meanwhile it was an accident we had before. Yeah. And now we had a a bone on bone healing. Yeah. Even, uh, so there are also porosis, arthritis, also occur. DVT. Yes. DVT. You have you have you have dusty feet. You have pain in the calf, and then you know you have all those signs too. Yeah, well, that one now we have D-dimer. D-dimer, then inflammation of this thing, and the lower limb. Yeah, and you still feel the blood vessels, the arterial very, flow. Very flow the pulse will be there, yeah. very no, almost normal. Yeah. So that's some bound they said because that's inflammation in that area, inflammation in those areas. Yeah. And so you know, so that, Okay, so what are the diagnostic tests? So there are so many diagnostic tests that have come up. But one of the things that are very, very simple to do is the ankle brachial pressure index. Now, people have gone on to the people have gone on to the toe brachial pressure index um, in this regard. So it's something to worry. So people are, have, have gone on to toe brachial pressure index um, in this regard. Um, but, uh, they also have duplex ultrasound, transcutaneous oximetry, stress testing, CT angio, uh, and then conventional angio, which is what we do a lot of here in the cardio care. And you can refer your patients. The good thing about catheter-based interventional one is that by the time you're already almost sure of it, um, and you go there, you can actually intervene at the same time. So it's not Absolutely. just to look yeah. ahead. Yeah. You just check it as you don't fix as well. So uh, maybe we'll go on to explain the ankle brachial uh, pressure index. So can you can you walk us through, sir? Okay. Um, from the, let, let's use the diagram of the presentation. Yeah. That will make it easier. Ankle brachial index simply means the index of the Ankle pressure, yeah, and the brachial. Yeah. So there's no big thing about it. So now, as you can see, they place the cuff on the brachial plexus. Now, with the help of the unheld Doppler, it actually amplifies the sound. Actually, amplifies the sound of the blood flow. You know, the principle of blood pressure is when you're occult, the first corrupt of sound you hear. It gives you the pressure at which that blood is flowing through the vessel. So now with this, you don't have to use a stethoscope again. What you actually use is just to handheld the blood. As you are relieving the pressure, relieving the pressure holding the from the cuff on the on the on the computer fossa with the handheld doppler, the first sound you hear is the first corrupt of sound. The same we have with the stethoscope. So, but the ultrasound, sorry, the handle Doppler amplifies it for you. So you record the value at that point. It's like just getting the systolic blood pressure. pressure. Normally, uh, uh, so when you do your blood pressure, yeah. just the systolic, that will give you your breakdown. Yes, yes. That, that gets it. So at the same time, something happens on the you record the, the blood pressure, the blood pressure. Now on this on the lower limb too, the same thing happens. You tie just before the the ankle, above the feet. You apply a pressure using the handheld up blade. Again. You check for when you're going to get the first sound. You record your pressure. But now you have two particular vessels. They have the basal pedis. That is the basal pedis um, artery there. That you're going to use in between the toe. And then you have the posterior tibia behind the that uh, media malleolus. Yeah. Now the issue now is we have to measure the Rosalis pedis record, measure the um, posterior tibia and record, get an average of it. But in some individuals, a few percent of individuals don't have Rosalis pedis at the position. They cannot feel it on, on position. So with those people, they can comfortably use their posterior tibia artery. So when you get this one, the posterior tibia and then the basal pedis, you get an average on it. Now, now do the ankle 
and the brachial index, which is the ankle pressure divided by the brachial pressure. That will give you some values. Now, from the classification, we have the normal. Yeah, so, yeah. so just, just to emphasize again for us, uh, what we are saying is that do your do your blood pressure right. Yeah. Just do your normal uh, arm, your normal blood pressure in your arm. Yeah. Then you take that as your systolic, your your brachial pressure. Then you come and try and do almost like a blood pressure in the leg. Now you use your Doppler. Now if you don't have the one that is for vascular, you can try and manage to use um, the one that is for uh, what do you call that thing. The, the one that they use for, for the one that they, the, the obstetricians use yeah, fetal, exactly fetal, fetal, fetal. so that's one they use to hear fetal heart yeah. just use it all of, most of us have this in our clinic so this is something you can do and if you're a private hospital I'm sure you can you can do something about it <laughs> so measure this one measure the uh, and then you now divide ankle over how do I do about it? over brachial yeah. So you have the systolic, take the higher one in the two arms of the two arms over the systolic. So it's systolic over systolic, and then you have a number. So let's assume the systolic blood pressure is 120, while in the lower limb, the blood pressure is uh, 100. 120 um, over 100 is 1.2. So that is, you know, perfectly normal. Okay. Now, as the, thing, the blood flow to the lower limb narrows, what will, what will generally happen? The it's like when you press a pipe, the pipe that you are using to wash your car. Yeah. You know, if you narrow the mouth, the blood flow will go faster. The pressure will simply shoot up, even though the volume goes. So when this blood flow in the lower limb is narrowed, the pressure will be higher. So systolic in the arm may be 120. Okay, while systolic in the leg might be 240. So 120 over 240 will be 0 0.5. So that will not tell you already. Yeah. Um, that you have, so that's how you now interpret. So, systolic pressure in the in the no, this is the wrong. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. This is a mistake. Sorry, it's the other way around. Thank you for correct. We corrected this the last time. Okay. Sorry, oh, sorry. Please, this this calculation will correct it in our slide. Pamela, please make sure you do it. This correction is this pressure in the lower limb over the pressure in the upper limb. Please, everybody, take note. That's a mistake. But the way we measure it is the same. It's essentially the same way um, you measure um, the, the um, this thing. So we cannot use duplex ultrasound. Essentially, is to look monophasic, biphasic, or triphasic. And you know, you you, you have limited view of tibia vessels. Typically, we send them to our radiologists, and they're able to do that in cardio care. And I'm sure most radiologists can be able to do this for you. The other thing that we try and do is our stress treadmill test. We typically use the treadmill test for ECG to do stress ECG, but we also can do it for this. So we do the ankle breaker index, then we do the treadmill exercise. Just a, we have a protocol we use. As you are doing that, you kind of are able to monitor the pain free walking distance and the peak walking time and the maximum distance. If you record this, this will serve as a baseline, especially for those that are not intervening on. You use this over time to, to check the worsening of their symptoms. So you can use your ABI to check, but you can also use the pain-free walking distance, how long they can walk before they start having pain, or and or um, peak walking time, or the maximum distance walk before they have pain. So um, typically, then you can now measure the, the lower limb arterial pressure, pulse volume, and ABI after exercise. So this typically um, reduces post-exercise in... Good thing about cities that city is non invasive. Our, our, I think we have lost, we have lost internet.
Sorry, we are back. We, are, we had some uh, network technical difficulties. Uh, technical difficulties. Uh, it's due to the dollar price. <laughs> I'm joking, no, I beg, no report to me. I'm joking. All right, so we are back uh, and we are showing our screen. We were talking about, we we're talking about CT. CT is non-invasive. Most times for our patients, before we go for conventional, we typically do CT. It gives us an idea, but remember that, you know, contrast is used. Your creatinine has to be okay. Patient has to have good kidney function, okay, before you go ahead with, um, with CT. And um, those are some things you need to just be sure about. And then, of course, it takes a longer time. Now, conventional angiography is the gold standard to be able to diagnose this, but um, it is invasive, minimally invasive, yes. This is what uh, we do in cardio care. Um, and we serve as the referral center for the entire Nigeria, really. We're one of the main people doing peripheral angiography in Nigeria. So we're a center of excellence for that. Um, but we remember that, uh, um, yes, we remember that, um, we remember that in this, it is invasive, it involves catheterization. It is invasive, but the risk is low. And typically, we're able to do um, angioplasty. If you look at these blood vessels from a, from a case that we've done, you can see the blood vessel coming from up, coming down. You can see this black area, and you can see this narrowing here. This is, you can see where the arrow is pointing. You can see the narrowing and then the blood supply. This is a straightforward, typical case that you will see. Very fantastic. What we do after taking this picture is that we will now take our catheter, a different type of catheter, and a different approach. Then we pass a wire across the narrowing. Then we pass a balloon. I will show you some pictures after all. This is um, my day job. <laughs> it will now pass a wire across this and then open it up. So with that same procedure, um, unfortunately, it's not particularly cheap. So, But with that same procedure, we're able to now fix this kind of uh, thing. And then the blood supply improves. So with this, you typically reduce morbidity. You reduce mortality. You reduce tissue loss. So if there's any gangrene and you restore the blood flow, it's not as if the gangrene will reverse. That area that is gangrenous still has to demarcate and go. But at least it will reduce from having above knee amputations. When we're in school, I'll be doctor and also, whether or whether or not this kind of patient will have above knee amputation. Mm -hmm. So as if it's that's not social at the upper at the upper limit. Uh -huh. Most times you do above knee or below knee. That won't be won't do. exactly because you know there's this thing about um, having a, a body cut for the radiographer. If you can give us vascular patterns, if it's possible to, we not unless we do. That be very very. We have to do this typically. When you want to do vascular patterns, you have to do the conventional yeah, angiography. Right. So you now do it. You can see all the okay. levels, not, so. and then you now take up make up your mind right. where, where, you are where you are doing. So typically in this case. Once we see this kind of thing, a straightforward single lesion, we are typically able to just open up uh, this kind of uh, flow. And then, you know, blood supply resumes. If there is gangrene, typically it demarcates clearly so the orthopedic can easily know what to do. And saving the knee is extremely important. For those that are prosthetists, when you have saved the knee, when you fix the prosthesis, it's easier for the person to walk than if you took above knee and the chair cannot walk. Now, the best case is if you, as the doctor here watching us, found the case early enough before they even had the limb loss, then we are more than able to, you know, open up this case um, and then they don't even have any gangrene at all. So this is typically um, when we are beginning to, so this is the cat lab. This is what happens to the cat lab. Um, patient is there, patient is awake. We are talking to the patient. And this is in cardio, this is actually our cat lab, this is live picture. And then we're able to now, pass the catheter into the leg across, then put a die and see that picture that we saw before. And then we can now um, take it from there. So essentially that's what, of course, remember this patient also has other cardiovascular yes. issues. So ECG is important, echo is important. A lot of times what will kill the patient is the other cardiovascular disease that is there, not just the limb. So if you look at this um, algorithm, um, I think we can go through this algorithm uh, very briefly. Let me see if I can zoom it in so that we can all um, look at it. So if you think the person you suspected them from history, 
they have history and examination suggestive of peripheral disease, breast pain, gangrene. Typically, you can go straight in any way you want, especially if you have a fetal Doppler. You can do your ankle brachial um, in the, If you have alternate diagnosis, they hit their leg, other things, you can move on. But if you have, you do ankle brachial pressure index, uh, you have non compressible arteries, that is the ABPI, ABI, you do that 1.4. The next thing to do, and it's a class one indication um, to do. Okay, and it's a class one indication, really. Um, the next thing we do is to do a toe brachial index. So if you do that same one, but this time you need a special cuff around the toe to, and using that same uh, vascular um, Doppler, using that uh, against the toe um, to do that. The toe brachial index, um, now we'll now do to, toe brachial index is simple. Yeah. Greater than 0 0.7 or less than 0 0.7. Greater than 0 0.7 is normal. Look for something else. If it's less than 0 0.7. So again, ABPI more than 1.4 with um, toe brachial pressure greater than 0 0.7 normal. However, if it's less than 0 0.7, then you need to now need to do your assessment uh, for that. Now, if it is normal and you still, you have a normal ABI or borderline ABI, the next thing to do is still um, now look for other modalities of, of assessment. However, if you have an abnormal one, ABI is less than 0 0.9. Typically, you just proceed straight to do your CTA, your invasive um, angio, like you can do in cardio care, or do your CT angiography of the lower limb. And that will help you directly. Or you can look for alternate diagnosis. So what we are saying from this is, number one, patient with all of these things, you have, you have examined them in the clinic, you examine them in the clinic, they have history and physical examination suggestive, a non-healing wound, do your angle break, break your pressure index. If it is less than 0 0.9, then go on to do your toe breaker index, or you can go on straight to your CT or invasive angiography. Or at the very, if it is more than 1.4, but the toe breaker index is, is less than 0 0.7, then you now go on straight also to um, consider this other distance here in Nigeria, because um, it's not very easy to get um, percutaneous, <laughs> you know, skin perfusion pressures and other things here in Nigeria. So what we typically do is ankle breaker pressure index, toe breaker pressure index, clinical examination, and then CT and geography and then um, go straight to invasive angiography, which is which you can get in cardio care. It's not common to get invasive angiography in many areas in Nigeria, but um, in, the, in the north, I think cardio care is the only place that more or less does peripheral angiography for the lower limb. So you can get them here, uh, and then we can get them in. Now, remember to re stratify the patients, look for other risks, manage other cardiovascular risk, and then we we'll revascularize uh, the patients, okay? We provide the patient. So, what are the goals of our treatment? In all of them, we want to try and get um, them better. We want to increase their walking distance. The distance they can walk without pain. We want to make sure they don't stop smoking. They get better glycemic control. Typically, we give them antiplatelets. Clopidogrel is very, very important in the in the in the conduct management. Some people have also talked about use of rivaroxaban, but if you are not a specialist, please. Be careful about using Varoxaban. But among specialists, you want to use high dose statins, clopidogrel, and we combine that with the Varoxaban typically. That gives you a better outcome, even before they come for invasive um, care. What about pentoxifilin? Uh, have you used that before? It's very, a fantastic drug, really. It's Actually, not very uh, available. Yes? Well, I like slostazol too, but the problem with slostazol is that the risk for sudden cardiac death is a little bit higher among patients using slostazol. So um, what you typically do is you try and do the ECG and the echo. If you can find no other significant uh, cardio cardiac problems, then I now move slostazol. If there's anything that is looking somehow in the other ones, I typically run away from slostazol. Otherwise, they can just have... But it gives you better outcome. You can see the walking distance by 50%, quality of risk. These are patients that you're not intervening. 
they have uh, just borderline in the ischemia. They, you manage every other thing, smoking, diabetes, sugar, cholesterol, and then you want to give, you now give them this one. Typically, clopidogrel and rivaroxaban is typically preferred, um, but you need to use low dose rivaroxaban. And by the time you are making the diagnosis as much as possible, get specialist input. You don't want to manage somebody that loses their leg. And they tell you that you could have referred them to where they could have had it and you did not. And now they have to cut off their leg. Uh, so it's very, very, and you know, remember, if you have peripheral arthritis in one limb, it typically is affecting the second limb. So if you don't take care of it, chances are the by the time they even get to us or to, to uh, because we're the main center for peripheral vascular disease intervention in Nigeria, uh, sometimes <laughs> it's bilateral though, and there's nothing we can do for both limbs. So it can be very devastating uh, for the patients. Now, what's the typical progression, sir? Well, what most patients, of course, are not asymptomatic from presentation until till they, they die. Have, they have some. Yeah, so a lot of them will just die. Asymptomatic will remain asymptomatic. But if you do good care, they also will not progress. Yes. You might do good care early, and they don't progress. Okay, but uh, <laughs> by the time patients have that um, peripheral established peripheral disease, uh -huh. we're very sure that the risk of death from stroke and coronary artery disease is very very high. It's very, very In fact, by the time you are seeing somebody with terminal education and all of those kind of things, just know that they are already marking their time and you need to be aggressive with managing their cardiovascular risk. So we are coming to an end. Um, I just want to um, talk about um, patients that should be referred. Any patient with critical limb ischemia must be referred. That is, they have numbness, they have rest pain, they have limb loss, they have gangrene. They need to refer to a more specialty center that takes care of feet, like us, where we can do the CT angio, we can do the invasive angio, and we can intervene with a stent or a balloon. They typically will need a multidisciplinary foot clinic. Physiotherapist is there, endocrinologist is there, like Dr. Adanya, or the artist is there, you know, uh, cardiac physiologist is there. To, to me measure their walk distance, pain-free walking distance. Then we manage their feet. Then we manage their cholesterol. We have to, as in, including psychologists sometimes, to manage those that have to stop smoking and other things. Abby? Yeah. So you need to, to, now, a lot of patients can be managed with revascularization, but we need an expert to help you differentiate who requires and who does not require. I should wait for two weeks to refer patients. <laughs> Please, within 24 hours is typically once we've noticed, you notice a foot ulcer in a diabetic. Please, that is an indication for referral. Because remember that foot ulcers may begin to indicate critical limb ischemia, like yes. we talked about earlier. Okay, and then those that achieve revascularize, if they have a favorable lesion, they have critical limb ischemia. Let me just show you some of the things and that we do. So sometimes we do balloon and geoplasty. In this case, you have a 100% occlusion. In this case that I'm showing you here, you have a 100% occlusion in this case. And um, you have a 100% occlusion in this case. So we can see in this place, we can see the endothelia. Sometimes we are unable to pass through um, this. So we do what we call a sub-intimal crossing, a sub-intimal crossing. We take our wire sub intimally and then come back into the vessel again before we inflate, it, especially when there's calcification here. So sometimes this place that I'm marking now will be heavily calcified and it may be very difficult to cross. So we use very special techniques, CTO techniques and CTO wires to do a sub intimal crossing and then we can now balloon and put a stent and then fix this. So we get anti grade flow. Other cases, we don't need to do that. We are successful, we just pass through. And then, great, no problem. But that is not always the case um, in, in our in our patient. So, yeah. So, what else um, do we do in intervention? You can see in this case, you can see this is a very high lesion. And you can already see the um, femoral head. So, automatically, this tells you this is a common femoral from the um, um, iliac to common femoral. And you can see the vision there. If you put your balloon and your stent there, you can see what happens after. And you can see very fantastic results. And blood supply is, is restored. And the risk of limb loss is uh, good. 
is good. So remember that peripheral artery disease is a key marker of cardiovascular disease. You need to aggressively manage cardiovascular risk. Um, you know, you need to manage their sugar, their smoking. Yeah, a lot of patients require revascularization, and that improves the quality of life and reduces risk for amputation. Uh, you know, people with diabetes and smokers are very high risk, and all Six patients times. Eh, very very Six high risk. Times. Six times higher for death and for other cardiovascular diseases. All patients with oscillation, with gangrene, with pain at rest, especially with abnormal ankle brachial index. I will show you how to do the ankle brachial index using just your normal speak and your fetal you doppler. Up, yeah. You can do your ankle brachial declare. You need to refer them for specialist assessment uh, as well. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, we are very grateful. We do not take it. So, so I apologize for the uh, video that went out. Our technical team is working around the clock uh, to make sure that we restore that. However, um, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. If you have any comments, also put them in the chat box. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then we will we, uh, get right to you. So I can see a lot of people have got the answer of Mr. Jibril. Umar Sadiq, Sadiq, I like your very long explanation. Uh, I can see Dr. Ola Golding, Semu, very senior colleague. Thank you for joining us, sir. And we are very ap appreciative of your, uh, of your joining and regular support and your presence. I can see some of our chiefs. I can see Dr. Aniek and Thomas, uh, my classmates. Thank you for joining us. Uh, who else can I who else can I recognize from the list of attendees? Um, so thank you very much. I'm sure that you if you have questions, you can ask. If you have your patients, you can refer them as well. Um, and we can help take care, care of them. Now, uh, ah, Dr. Adeye, thank you for joining us, uh, Victor. Uh, so um, so somebody said, do you give aspirin and cotopegrel together? Or is either okay? So by the time you are getting to this point, you typically should request for specialized input. But typically, a lot of times we give them together in these patients as pre and clopidogrel. But you must have confirmed to an extent that there is. We give them together, or we give clopidogrel and uvaroxaban. In some cases, we give all three. A patient I saw today is on all three of them: aspirin, clopidogrel, and uvaroxaban. But we know that there's a higher bleeding risk, so it is also important to note that you should be very careful about this. So typically, you need the specialist input. Um, somebody says, thank you for the informative presentation. I want to confirm information. I was told that elderly persons above 80 years have no need for blood thinner like vasoprene. Uh, and if they did not use any younger, is this true? OK, so the need for vasoprene is not determined just by whether age or not. You need to use the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk disease predictor. So if you on your phone, if you have downloaded MD Calc, what are that uh, There are many calculators. You need to calculate for any of your patients. You put your age, you put patient blood pressure, you put the patient cholesterol, you put all that, and calculate the cardiovascular risk. It is based on ASCVD score, the risk of having a cardiovascular disease that determine whether vasoprene is needed in patients with cardiovascular disease. But we don't give vasoprene for everybody. Now, you say blood thinners like vasoprene. Vasoprene is not a blood thinner. Blood thinners are anticoagulants. Vasoprene is an antiplatelet. They work differently. So, very important. But not everybody should get aspirin. I see a lot of people that everybody in protection, they just give aspirin. That is the Bidaya advert. That is not medicine. You only reserve aspirin and computer grail for those that, um, those that um, require. Um, yeah, we we'll only give aspirin and torpedo grail for those um, that have a very high um, cardiovascular um, risk, prior cardiovascular risk. Okay, I don't know if there are any more questions. If, if there are any more questions, I just want to talk about cardio care. Um, we are here in Abuja. Um, we want to bring you this every month, we bring a, a webinar. Our commitment to teach and to improve healthcare in cardiovascular healthcare in Nigeria is, is um, our commitment is 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 reserved. Um, and um, so you can always reach out to us to refer your guests, and uh, most of our specialists will be here to help you. 
uh, to support and to serve your practice. We, you can join our WhatsApp group. Um, Pamela will put the link in the chat group. So you see a link in the chat group. If you are joining us for the first time, you can join the WhatsApp group. In the WhatsApp group, we typically will announce our webinars so that you can get them first time. Please in, invite your friends, invite others. Um, and then at the end of each webinar, we typically will send you your CME points. We'll send you the slides and we'll send you a link to the YouTube uh, video of the recording of the, so that in case you had glitches, or you enable. So we have VIP suits, ICUs, and we started our cardiac surgery. Um, even for structural heart, for children with um, uh, congenital heart disease, we have an international partnership now, and we can do a structural heart intervention. That means we don't have to open the hearts. We don't have to do open heart surgery for those children with, with um, cardiac disease. We can just, through the same blood vessel that we use for this peripheral artery, we go, we put a device, it blocks the hole in the heart, without surgery, the, patient, the child can go home the next day. So patients don't have to travel for this anymore. We are very happy and thank God for this opportunity. Uh, we thank you all for see, staying with us till the end of this, um, of this, um, you know, of this webinar mm -hmm. today. And I trust God that it will, your practice will be improved uh, remarkably. Please remember to join us for any of our webinars and uh, we look forward to serving you and working well with you. Uh, you can refer to our hospital using any of these uh, means. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think we've answered all the questions. The WhatsApp link, just hold on for a few minutes. Pamela will add it to the... To the, the somebody says, can somebody with, a, with low platelets give have aspirin? It depends. If the patient has... That's Dr. Ojo. If the patient has low platelets, um, you should be wary about aspirin. You should check your ASCVD score and be sure that they need it. And then you will now do your risk benefit ratio. Uh, we have had to give patients with very low risk. Uh, so, Pamela, if you cannot add the link, please, some people are adding their numbers. So, you may be able to add them through that. Okay, hey, you have to look for the cause of the low platelets as well. There may be other reasons why you have low platelets, which you have to treat uh, for there. Are there any special indications for using all three? There are, but that is a specialist level, so it typically should have referred at that time. There are, special, there are indications for using all three. Severe cases, cases where uh, we need to um, deal with clots, at the same time we need to put a stent. So we put a stent in and we are thinking that there are a reason for blood clots, we typically we need to use all three, uh, but you have to be very careful. Bleeding risk is high, hemorrhagic stroke is high, you know, and you have to be very careful about that. Typically, we reserve that for specialist input. So, but we'll be able to highlight how to make, how to, um, the, Pamela, maybe you'll send the link via email to yeah. all of them. It's not, you are not able to do that. So, join all of them. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate. Please, um, please uh, invite your colleagues for our next webinar will happen in a month. We'll go in, into detail. I think we will do something like that. What's our next topic? But I think we'll do ECG. ECG. Oh, wow. We'll do ECG. I promise you, read ECG. So our next one will do ECG. Get ready. Invite everybody in your in your circle to come and learn. Thank you very much. Uh, we've come to an end of this webinar. Um, please remember, stay in Nigeria. Help us. Don't Japan. Don't Japan. Don't, 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 stay. Let us take care of our patients. Let us share with each other. Let us work together and um, let us work together 